want to begin by talking about what a paradigm shift is, because this is a phrase that's used very casually. What we believe is that, in fact, we're living through a fundamental shift in human communication. This is not a modest shift. This is not an incremental shift. This is a fundamental shift. And when Thomas Kuhn was talking about how scientific revolution takes place, he focused attention on how humans originally conceived of our place in the universe as Earth was at the center of the universe and all the other planets were around the Earth and they traveled around the Earth in perfect circles and humans were thus at the very center. This geocentric model changed as the data collection improved. As the data collection got better and better, the model had to become more and more complicated. It turns out it wasn't the Earth at the center of the universe of concentric circles, but in fact, the Earth was a little bit off the center and all the planets traveled on circles and those circles went around the Earth. And as you can see, they traveled at different speeds. And what you get is a big, wobbly mess. But humans held on to this belief system in part because it's what they always believed. And so the work in collecting the data and refining the model was driven by a desire to save the appearances. How can we make the model more complex to account for the data, but not change the model. The paradigm shift occurred when Galileo collected new data and Copernicus offered a vision of the universe that said, the Earth isn't at the center. The sun is. And the other planets go around the sun. And that simple shift in perspective changed every major institution humans have created. It changed government. It changed cultural institutions. It changed religious institutions. And the result is that we have a paradigm shift. And if you're an astronomer, you cannot hold that the Earth is at the center of the universe. If you're not an astronomer, it doesn't matter. We gave a poll at this talk in Chicago. 10% of the 400 respondents said Earth is at the center of the universe. But it doesn't matter. A paradigm shift doesn't mean that everybody changes their point of view. And it also, most significantly, doesn't mean that the planets were changed. They didn't change at all. It's how we saw them that changed. A paradigm shift is a shift in perspective. It's a new way of organizing information. So if we talk about a paradigm shift, and we're talking about now a move from a print-centric universe to a network-centric universe. If a paradigm is a way of organizing your data, which is really saying that you're organizing the elements in your system, we have to begin by asking, well, what are the elements in our print-centric system? What are the elements that we're talking about? But as Richard said, we also have to really look carefully at this idea of paradigm shift because people have difficulty with the concept because they imagine, well, a paradigm shift, everything seems the same to me. It's not that the clocks all of a sudden start running backwards and the sun is rising on the other side. That's not how a paradigm shift happens. As Richard said, it's your relationship to that data that changes. So if we look at what's happening now with our global economy, if you look at what's happening in Europe, it doesn't matter whether the farmer in Greece understands what globalization is. It doesn't matter whether he knows what it is, whether he believes in it. It doesn't matter whether he knows what globalization is for the effects of the economy in Greece to ripple across the rest of the world. And it doesn't matter whether he understands that decisions that are being made in foreign capitals all around the world and by foreign markets are actually rippling back to Greece. It doesn't matter. But that's, in fact, what's happening. So for us, in our print-centric world, we say, well, at the university, I walk outside, everything looks the same. 
buildings are still there. Students are still there. Teachers are still holding lectures. Everything looks the same. But if we look around at the other institutions that are centered around print, we notice that, in fact, everything has fundamentally changed under our feet. So we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we in the academy adjust to the new reality of a network-centric world? What does it look like for our work now? One way to think about this paradigm shift is to imagine where you would place your work if you wanted it to get the most attention now. Would you put it in print or would you put it up on the web? The understanding of this change involves something that in a way is that simple. Where do you imagine your work ending up? And if the final destination isn't paper, but in fact is a screen, then we need to think about what the future of education is because that changes all the relationships. It changes the teacher's relationship with the student, the student's relationship with the print, and it also means that unlike in the past, when you asked students to compose and write a paper, what they did was they produced text. What it means to compose in the 21st century means to compose using images, sound, moving images, material you yourself have collected. The emphasis now is on resourcefulness. Now that's not cleverness, that's not going viral. We're not interested in having students produce the video that goes viral. We're interested in producing people who are thoughtful in this moment of a transition from information scarcity to information superfluity. One way to think about this change is to think about how much the notion of privacy has been transformed in the past 10 years. When we think of people being educated, we think of this as work that happens largely in private, largely with the doors closed, largely in an encounter between yourself and ideas. Now, however, we live at a time when it's possible to watch the greatest thinkers of our time who are working on the most important problems of our time think in real time. We don't have to wait for their ideas to be fully formed and released and published via some paper-based vehicle, we can now watch this thinking happen in public in real time. There are many different vehicles for doing this, but what they share in common is a shift in the understanding of who owns ideas. Watching these thinkers think in public is to watch people say the most important problems of our time are so important that I'm going to get the ideas out there now. And we can talk about them, we can improve them, we can vet them, but our work collectively is to think together in public. We do this because the problems we face now are bigger than problems humans have ever faced in the past. And I say that advisedly because all the major problems that your generation is going to face all come with this adjective that didn't come with the problems when I was growing up. All of your problems are global. Global economic collapse, global war without end, global environmental change. Addressing those problems and thinking those problems is fundamentally collaborative. It's fundamentally collective. And so what the technology makes available to us now is the ability to engage in this work collectively and collaboratively from wherever we happen to be situated. So Richard and I are composition teachers. We teach writing. We're interested in writing as a vehicle for extending ideas, a vehicle for extending thought, 
And writing understood in that way is not confined to any discipline. It's not confined to English. It's the work of the university. So we ask ourselves, well, what does it look like to write? Well, now, as we've moved to cloud-based computing, we can actually start to answer that question. What does it look like to write? We can now bring the work of our students into our class. We can watch them write in real time, see the issues that they're having with their writing, and have that be part of the work of our classes. So at the Rutgers Writing Program, we begin with a relatively simple premise, yet I find it actually quite revolutionary. We begin with a collection of nonfiction prose. We challenge our students to engage with these complex pieces written by multivariant thinkers. We encourage them, we challenge them to make connections between the pieces that they're reading. They don't read them in isolation. They read them in sequence, and they connect the ideas between these pieces. And then we help them, we facilitate them as they compose their own thinking. So we can now watch them as they're doing that. And one of the fascinating things as we move to cloud-based computing is we can actually see the connections that they make that don't make it into their final papers. We can see the ideas that they begin to form and then throw away, that they erase, that they're not quite sure what to do with. And those very often are the most complex thoughts you're going to have because you're not sure what to do with them. You're not sure how to deal with them, the implications of the connections that you're starting to make. Where does this lead? I'm not quite sure. I better get rid of that. Writing has always been about the way that it's been taught is it's about being clear and precise, about saying something in a clear, straightforward, succinct way. But that's not really what thinking is. And if you think about writing as a vehicle for thinking, those thoughts are complicated. They're complex. They go in different directions. And we want to see our students actually thinking about writing in that way. So when they do, how do we bring those connections into the class and facilitate them, help them follow the implications of the ideas that they're coming up with and see where they lead? We all know that you learn how to write not by writing, but by rewriting. Revision is the essence of learning how to write. What first comes out is your first thought. And so as we watch students write, we're interested in how they come to rewrite. And by moving the activity of writing into public, we make the revision process public and visible because we solve the problem that has bedeviled writing instruction from the beginning. And that is the problem of audience. Who is the audience for student writing? There isn't one. When I ask my students, think of your audience, they say, I am. It's you. <laughs> what this makes possible is that there is an audience. Now it's possible to get response in real time. And equally as significant, you come to see that there's not a writing process. There are many writing processes. When I was in college, I wrote papers longhand on legal paper. And I was what's called a perpetual first drafter. I would write. I'm left-handed. I have terrible handwriting. I would make a mistake. I'd rip the page off, set it down, and start over because the first page had to be perfect. And once I got that first page perfect, everything would be so locked down that everything else would follow. And I wrote that way for my entire college career. And I wrote exactly the same paper for my entire college career. And it wasn't until I got into graduate school that I was introduced to another way of thinking about revision and another way of thinking about writing, thinking about writing as a way of extending thought rather than simply reporting what you'd already figured out. And then I realized that the way I was writing and revising wasn't the way people write. I was writing the way insane people write. 
that sense that you can control everything. That in fact your writing isn't an invitation to have a conversation and get the idea better, but that your writing is to show that you're the best. Which, oddly enough, I failed dramatically to do because my writing was so hermetically sealed. Who would want to read it? So watching students revise in these other ways, you can come to see that there are multiple ways of responding to outside voices and that that ability to respond is the essence of the revisionary process. So what we see here is students in a network-centric environment, they're actually engaging with each other's work. They're not engaging on paper in some global way. They're actually getting into the text and they're having a conversation with the writer about that person's writing. They're getting in line and they're working with the writer, challenging their ideas, helping them to extend their own ideas, helping to complicate the connections that they're making. And writing in this way turns into really what it should be, which is much more of an open engagement with ideas. And this is the kind of writing that has the potential to open up your own work. You're opening it up to others. You're putting your ideas out there in public and encouraging your classmates to engage with your ideas. The work of this class is made open to everybody. All the students see all the students' papers. You want to know how they're answering this question? Have a look. See what they're doing. See what passages they're focusing on. See how they're developing those ideas. See how they're extending those passages. And see what you think about it. What do you think? So this is a different way to think about engagement. It's not your own idea that you hold to yourself until the end. It's your idea in conversation with others. What you see here is an example of a student who's become invested in their work to the point that they left this comment in at the end as a defense of the central axis of this paper. So they're saying, this is the paper that I wrote. This is what I wanted to say. And in case you missed it, here's what I meant. This is my central axis. This is the central idea of my paper. And she defended it to her fellow classmates. Her fellow classmates were saying, well, are you sure you looked at this correctly? Are you sure you're reading that passage correctly? And she said, no, this is what I meant. And this is why I think this passage is important. So we have the ability now, again, through cloud-based computing, to get behind student writing, to get behind our own writing. So we've talked about learning in public, writing in public. It's also the case that we can watch people thinking in public. You take something as common as a newspaper editorial, and you can see that the shift from imagining a newspaper as the vehicle for providing you with the understanding of the world solely through paper is transformed once that newspaper is put online. And we spoke earlier about the challenges of reading online, that there's so many other things that you can look at immediately as soon as it goes online. But you can take a piece that is online and you can begin to watch the texts that a writer is working with as he or she comes up with their ideas. The mystery and the magic of human insight is made more available to us because we can pull out and see the resources that the writer is working with week to week. So in this instance, we can provide you with a vision, a 3D topography of the textual world that a writer moves through. And you'll see in front of your eyes that it's not only text. It's video. It's sound. It's historic newspapers. This is a different understanding of hyperlink. Hyperlinking was part of the original idea of the web. That's what hyperlinking is. You don't know what something is. You underline it. You link to that word, that concept, that author, find out more information. This is a different understanding of hyperlinking. What this author does is he provides for you the material that he's thought through. And this is an author who's modeling, who's demonstrating what it means to engage with the ideas of others. So what he does is he provides for you that material. He creates the landscape through which he worked as he was developing this idea. So this is an argument that this author has developed. And what he's doing is saying, this is what I was working through as I was thinking about this. This is the material. What do you think? 
So you can now look at the canvas. You can look at the material that this author has engaged with and that he's connecting with as he moves through his own argument. Now, there was an article that was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education about this very author, and it was by a humanities professor, an English professor. And this English professor took apart the phrasing of this particular author. That's what he took issue with. This is a writer who week to week is affecting, who's really leading public debate. And instead of talking about, and instead of engaging with what this writer is talking about, this humanities professor is taking issue with the phrasing that he's using to say it. Now that seems to me to be a missed opportunity. We don't want our students to think about necessarily the phrasing, not that phrasing doesn't matter, not that style doesn't matter, but that it's content that does matter. That's what writing is about. It's about engaging with the ideas of others and presenting your own thoughts. So to take issue with the phrasing that somebody is using in order to make an argument is to miss the point. This is connective thinking in real time, week to week. This is what we should be dealing with. What strikes me in this example is the way in which what it means to read now means to be informed across many different vectors in many different directions. And that what this image makes visible is the fundamental act of thinking is realized in the act of making connections. And so what does it mean to write in the 21st century? It means to make connections, but not simply between printed texts, but between a whole variety of forms of human expression. And that you, in that act of writing, can simultaneously make your archive available to others so that the result is interactive, and that what your act of writing is is a way of generating or initiating further discussion. The final place we want to take you is actually the place where most of us got drawn into this work to begin with, and that's the activity of reading. In some sense, reading, one imagines it as, by definition, the most private act. It's you and the work and your thoughts with the work. It is possible, however, to move reading into the public sphere. And we do that in our courses by beginning with text. We feel that text is an invaluable, essential element for any of our courses. And so we begin with extended pieces of nonfiction prose to orient our students in the world of text, in the world of print. But right away in doing that, the textual world now brings with it interviews with the author, authors writing in different voices, writing letter to the president, writing policy statements. Suddenly it's possible to pull the author out of the world of just being the composer of the book you're reading and see that author in three dimensions. So we begin our classes, again, with a series of foundational texts. And what this does is it introduces students to how a multivariant thinker deals with an open-ended complex issue or problem. Not an issue or problem that has an answer, because the issues and problems that Richard referenced before, the global war on terror, global economic collapse, globalization in general, these problems don't have answers. They have ways of being understood and moved through. So we introduce students to texts that model for them how a multivariant thinker moves through a complex problem. And then we encourage the students to develop their own syllabus during the course of the semester. So they develop, they begin with these foundational texts and then move out and develop their own syllabus during the course of the semester. They start from there and say, okay, these texts give us points of departure. Where can we go from there? And these are things that happen essentially in real time because these issues and problems are developing day to day. So it brings them out into the web. We can now not only collect the work of the semester, not only develop our syllabus together, but we can actually read together online. This is taking the act of reading that Richard referenced before, which was traditionally done in your room, by yourself, you engaging with the text, and it moves it out into the public. 
So what that does is it gives us the ability as teachers to show students, to essentially teach students how to read. Not to say, great article, move on. But what piece are you interested in here? What is this author referencing here? Where does that lead us? What are the implications of the point that he's making here? So you can open up for students a way of thinking about reading that goes outside of the text itself. Again, this is not looking at the web as flying over information. This is looking at the web in the sense of how does it help us drill down into information? We want to move away from an understanding of the web as something that can only lead to superficiality and flyovers, which is what we hear in the news all the time. The web also has the potential to open up vistas for us that we can drill into. That's a different understanding of what we can do with the information that's available to us now. We can look at people, students, who are engaging with the talks that they're seeing online and they're submitting their own questions. And the person who gives the talk or the author responds to them. Thank you for the questions. Um, I'm here in my office in Stockholm and I'm going to answer them one by one. The potential here, if you're interested in ideas, if you're interested in increasing the size of the classroom and the effect of teaching, is really limitless. The challenge is producing the curiosity that will drive people to engage in this use of the technology. It's obvious that the technology can be used for other purposes. I think the web in general is an argument for the value added of education because left to our own devices, we devolve to the dominant discourse of the web, which is parody, to make fun of stuff. And the lost opportunity for educators to see that this is the future of composing that composing is about organizing your ideas across a range of media, finding an audience, adjusting your ideas in response, in conversation with the responses your audience has given you. This is what it means to think in the world and to turn away from the prison house of the self and to begin to engage with the largest problems of our time. Real problems are open-ended and have no final solution, no ultimate solution. What the current moment requires is people who are capable of thinking in the face of information overload, in the face of perpetual sense of crisis, and to see this as an opportunity for bringing about change for the creation of a better world. That's what we think the humanities are for. That's what we think the value of learning how to think, read, write, and work in public now resides. That's the nature of this paradigm shift, that we've moved from a world that's print-centric to a world that's network-centric. And that's the world that you all will be working in. Thank you.